Welcome to Australian musician uh, Jeff Martin. Um, today, uh, I'd like to kick start by saying congratulations on the 25th anniversary of Triptych. Um, yeah, an amazing, um, event. quite a quite a milestone um, to achieve. Um, and, you know, just very proud of this band. Uh, you know, like most uh, rock and roll bands that have gone on for this long, we've certainly had our ups and downs. But, uh, you know, these musical milestones that exist in our career, I'm very proud of. And this this one for sure and certain, because uh, I've been having to go back and listen to Triptych uh, because of the upcoming tour here in Australia. And we're going to be doing some deep cuts from that record. And, um, and I hadn't listened to it for quite some time. And I'm I'm simply amazed at how uh, how it has stood up. You know, um, it's it doesn't sound like a, you know a '90s band. It sounds like it could be coming out today. You know, and it's just uh, it's uh, quite an accomplishment. I'm, I'm very proud of it. For sure, yeah, I I've listened to it countless times, and it's um, it's a very like most of your music, very uh, timeless. I guess it does. It's not dated. Um, well, thank you. That... On that album is all the different instruments you used. Having gone back and listened to that, have you are you bringing some of those instruments to Australia on your upcoming tour? Um, well, most of those instruments uh, live here in my house on the Sunshine Coast. Um, so my uh, my home is like a a museum of sorts, you know, so <laughs> of, of world music instruments, but. Um, the one thing that um, time has afforded me and the wisdom that comes with, uh, you know, spending time on the road is that um, those exotic instruments from, you know, Morocco and India and um, Turkey, other places, uh, they don't really like the rock and roll lifestyle. They don't handle the road very well. So uh, there are some that's going to be coming out for the show. Like I'll be playing um, Oud, uh, which is a, a Middle Eastern lute. Um, I'll be playing that for Halcyon Days, and uh, I believe I might be bringing out my Sarod, which is uh, an Indian string instrument, um, if we do Inanna from The Edge of Twilight. Um, so some of them will make it, but most of them are just staying put. You know? Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I, I remember when I first heard your music, it was just so different to everything else I'd heard around at the time and uh, very attracted to that real Middle Eastern rock sound and the different instruments that you use. It's, um, and it certainly comes out um, on this album. I mean, I can't wait to see you next month. It'll be an amazing tour yet again. Where, where are you based? Um, which um, I'm in Melbourne. Ah, fantastic. Um, well, you'll be playing at the Palais. Yeah, the Palais is one of the, it's one of the beautiful temples of the Tea Party. You know, we've played that place so many times and every every concert we've ever done there has just been a magical evening. So very, very much looking forward to it. I've been at a few of those concerts too and it's just unbelievable. I'm a massive fan, obviously, of the Tea Party. So, um, no, it, it's great. Um, could you tell us, um, you know, from... For the fans out there of the Tea Party, just talk a little bit about this um, triptych album and how you put it together and chose different songs on the album. Do you remember back? Yeah. Um, essentially, I would say triptych is a it's an alchemical marriage of the edges of twilight and transmission. Because um, obviously, edges was all about our um, you know our foray into um, instruments from the Middle East and from Morocco and from India, um, mixing that with hard rock music. But um, but then transmission was a totally different um, avenue that we took, where uh, it was using a lot of electronic sounds um, in hard rock. And um, so triptych ended up being like the best of both worlds in in a way. Um, and I think that's um, you know. We were at the height of our creative powers at that time. I think um, there was there was nothing left on the table. We were using everything that we had and throwing everything at everything we had for triptych. Yeah. And um, 
the songwriting very very strong on triptych uh was those you know those songs still stand the test of time have been coming down gone um the halcyon days you know uh just goes on and on like samsara That's taking cool. me away it's uh it's quite um it's like you know there's it's all killer no filler on that one that's for sure you know <laughs> so i mean um, yeah when i listen to that album there's not a bad song on there from my point of view i, I just think it's a really solid album all the way through i was just um curious and you've probably been asked this a, a million times um choosing a cover uh, with the messenger what, what was your um decision making behind that well um to tell you the truth i've been um i've been a fan of daniel lenoir's solo work since the beginning of the 90s like with his uh um first solo album i believe it's his first solo album called akavi um when we were touring in the early 90s in canada you know in a little panel band and uh you know trying to get our big break and i mean i listened to that uh that cassette at the time <laughs> um i listened to it over and over again like i fell in love with uh, lanois production like you know i mean i was familiar with it because of his work with you too the joshua tree the Unf unforgettable fire but his stuff on its own uh there's something um very esoteric about his production style and it was something that i aspired to as a producer i had not yet um produced the tea party's first album splendor solace but it was my intention you know that uh, like being like daniel and law being a hero of mine and also jimmy page you know being the producer of led zeppelin mm. i wanted to be the producer of the tea party even though i didn't know anything about producing but um, but I learned from the best, you know, and listening to Daniel's work, um, getting to the messenger, uh, because it was so ingrained in my psyche, uh, both the Acadie record and the second one for the beauty of Way Viona, I believe it's both. Um, those, those two records in particular, they really, um, stood out for me and of course the messenger is the first song on the second solo record of daniels and uh and so haunting mm -hmm. and we would actually put that in um i believe it was save me we would put the messenger in the middle of save me and this is during the um the edges of twilight years uh when we would do like you know save me would take 20 minutes to finish on yeah. stage because you never knew where we were going to go but one of the um, one of the signposts that we reached in the jam of Save Me in the Middle would, would like more often than not we would put the messenger in there, and it became a song that fans loved and not familiar with Daniel Lanois' version thought it was our song, and um, and the record company uh, basically uh, you know they never they never really got involved with our records but they asked us very very politely on uh, when we were doing the triptych sessions, if we would consider doing that as a cover because of the reaction that it would always get when we would play it live. And um, that's the way uh, it came about. And, you know, had to put a different spin on it. It had to sound like the Tea Party and not the copycat of Daniel's version. Yeah. But I tell you this, um, like to get the feedback from one of your heroes and Daniel saying that, you know, he prefers our version to his is something that, you know, just blew me away. That's an amazing song. And yeah, every time I've seen you and you've sung that song, the crowd, you just, you can tell it's a crowd favorite for sure. You know, yeah. And initially I never knew it was a cover version to be quite honest. I thought it was your song. So, um, yeah. There you go. Like, like probably a lot of our, your fans initially until they sort of, you know, dig, dig a bit further. So um, just um, looking back on your musical sort of history, um, I, I note that your father was a musician. Um, and yeah. What sort of influence did he have on you as when you were young? Uh, blues. It was um, a lot of blues music, um, you know. Albert King, B.B. King, Freddie King, um, you know, even the older stuff like uh, Robert Johnson, Sunhouse, uh, Blind Willie Johnson, 
you know, it, it's, uh, I had a, an excellent, excellent education at a very early age. Cause I, you know, I started playing guitar when I was seven. Yeah. Um, and I took to it very, very quickly. And so my dad saw this and then, you know, just started sitting me in front of the turntable and playing on uh, these blues records. And, uh, you know, so blues guitar, like when I was 11 years old, I was, you know, doing like note for note, Steve Ray Vaughan stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, and you know, I mean, in my opinion, if you're going to be a rock guitarist, if you don't have um, that, that basement, you know, of the blues in your, in your psyche and your soul, um, well, I don't know if you're going to fare so well. So, but so, you know, I mean, others have, you know, there's punk music and all that stuff, but it's just uh, where my skills had to take me eventually. Um, I'm so grateful uh, to my father for giving me that education at an early age, you know, and like it's an understanding as well, and especially um, being a, a vocalist, um, listening to the blues as well was a big part of the development of my voice, you know, and you know, before I hit puberty, you know, trying to sing like B.B. King, you know, and all that stuff, right? So, yeah. Um, and when I hit puberty, well, man, the voice went low. So there you go. There you go. Yeah, that was going to be my next question was when did you discover your, the voice that you have? You know, that's, you know, quite a beautiful, deep baritone voice. Did you have that at a, you know, what sort of age did that come about? Like after puberty it or? Or just uh, it, it kind of came about in my, um, and actually in my 20s, like, or, well, no, my late teens, like I'd say like 18, 19 years old, because here's the story. Um, so Jeff Burroughs and I, um, when we started high school, actually back even before that in grade school, Jeff Burroughs and I had our first band together when I was 10 years old and he was 11. Yeah. And uh we would play like beatles covers and all that and um uh, we play in our gymnasium uh, at our school in front of 800 screaming kids that were only screaming because they were out of class you know and um but our fathers like jeff's father had an eight track um recording machine and he recorded us back then and man my voice sounds like michael jackson <laughs> you know like it just something like you know that's listening to it and it's like that can't be me but it was and um and then throughout high school uh, jeff and i had bands uh you know we play the high school dances and all that but like a lot of the you know as it was the uh the fashion at the time um there's a lot of post-punk stuff the new wave that we were playing like echo and the bunnyman and the cure and the smiths and all that so uh and i was singing but it was like you know, not like I do now. It was just a different sort of thing. And then, um, and then Stuart Chatwood and I started a band called the Stickmen, which was sort of like a mod revival band. You know, the Parkas and the Scooters and all that stuff. And uh, um, and Stuart was actually the singer, and I was just the lead guitarist. And one night, um, Stuart's guitar went down, and uh, he was trying to fix it, and we had a you know a captive audience in front of us about 200 people packed into this little pub and uh, we had to continue on and so the bass player Dave Seren said to me you know well Marty you know like why don't you do it man like you know just cover for Stuart and so um, I was like okay guys well how about this let's do some 12 bar blues and we did um, you know Jimi Hendrix's version of Red House and I sang and um and that's the first time I remember that voice coming out because I hadn't sang for a couple of years. Wow. And then singing Red House and but singing it like, you know, like a B.B. King style. And um, that's the first time that I actually heard that voice come out of me. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, just on you were mentioned about obviously Jeff Burroughs and yourself, um, having a lifelong friendship, well, really the whole three of you, to be honest, but um, you can really see and feel that in your music and when you see you live, I mean, that. what's it like to have that lifelong friendship with the other two guys? Um, such a hard 
question to answer because uh, it, uh, I get emotional when I think about it, when I think about how much we have accomplished and, um, and how we've stayed together, you know, more or less through thick and thin. Um, like I, the, the love I have for those two um, is, you know, fathomless. And um, uh, it's just a blessing. It truly is just a blessing to be able to get on that stage with those two incredible musicians and to create something that, you know, the way that we create music, no one else can do. I know this. Yeah. And, um, and I'm just, uh, just absolutely grateful for this gift. And, um, and it's the gift that keeps on giving because I swear to God, um, like the last tour that we did, um, it was um, October, November of last year in Canada. And uh, I swear that the band is actually getting better every time we get on stage, and, you know, which you'd think that, you know, now in our, our midlife, you know, you'd think that we'd be starting to slow down, but you know, we're not, it's just, it's, huh. it's the, um, the fountain of youth that is rock music, you know, you just, it just keeps you so energized and um, it's, it's electric. For sure. Are you um, making any sort of new music at the moment? New working to Certainly. Or... Um, I am, uh, well, I've got two songs down that I've sent to the boys. Um, you know, like they're schematics, but they're pretty, pretty developed schematics. Um, but, you know, leaving room for them to, you know, contribute, you know, their parts to it. Uh, but yeah, like, um, you know, it's it's getting exciting. I'm working on one right now that's uh, you know, very, very Moroccan. Um, it'll be a monster if it turns out how I think it's going to. Like, I hear it all finished in my head. Yeah. And if it gets to that point, it's going to be like another, you know, Tea Party classic. It'll be a monster. Nice one. Yeah. Mor Moroccan roll, as they say. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um. Heading towards the end here, um, what sort, what music are you listening to at the moment out there that has caught your interest? Um, well, to tell you the truth, um, my, my wife and I are like big foodies. You know, um, we don't eat a lot, but we love to cook. And uh, and when we do, uh, depending on what part of the world we're going to, is uh, music that accompanies us in the kitchen. You know on the little Wonder Boom speaker. And uh, so, um, and because of this Moroccan song that I'm working on, uh, there's been a lot of Moroccan music in the house, and but a lot of the folk music, um, um, you know, Bedouin uh, music. So there's a lot of that going on. It depends on what I'm researching. Um, and then, uh, you know, we just, uh, just to keep up with things, um, I, I do listen to Triple J still quite a lot. Um, it's not the Triple J of the old days, but uh, it's it's interesting, and I um, I just like to keep my ear on like what's going on um, out there. And um, some of it is uh, some of it's quite cool out of the production, but uh, a lot of it is a bit throwaway. But you know, you got to keep trying and you got to keep listening. So, but um, and to tell you the truth. Um, my mornings, uh, I, I mean, I'm listening to classical music up until like one o'clock. I just find that it keeps me calm um, until the afternoon. Um, really, kind of uh, resets my mind. Um, I love the challenge of listening to classical music because I listen to it for the counterpoints and you know the just the different musical styles and, and the way that different composers uh, would handle things. And um, so. You know, um, keep keeping my mind strong that way. Oh, good. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today, and um, absolute can't wait to see you next month in Melbourne. Uh, wish you all the best with the tour. And um, on the last note, I saw you're advertising the uh, tea party whiskey at the moment, and. Um, I love my yeah. whiskey. I'm quite tempted to get a bottle and get you guys to sign it. So, uh, oh, you should definitely get one, man, because it is pretty smooth. Let me tell you, it's, it's yeah, it's a bit dangerous, 
you know, so just moderation is the key, right? Yeah. So oh, well, that's yeah. that's right. Just um, just a, a little one at night goes a treat. Yep. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you uh, for your time today, and um, yeah, we'll see you next month. Okay. Well, Aiden, listen, you, you did a great job, by the way. Great job. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Enjoy okay. it. Okay. Thanks. All right.